Good evening. Uh, welcome. I'm Eileen Fuchs. I am the president and executive director of the National Building Museum. I came into this role last week, and I'm excited and honored to lead this incredible institution. Thank you for joining us this evening for this important program, part of the museum's ongoing celebration of its 40th anniversary. We are the country's foremost cultural institution dedicated to telling the stories about and inspiring curiosity in our built world, the places where we play and work and live. For over four decades, the National Building Museum has presented celebrated exhibitions that have touched on everything from design and construction to advances in sustainability and resilience to social justice and equity issues. Our public programs have also advanced the museum's role as thought leader by addressing important and timely topics, including tonight's focus on elevating an undertold story about the Rosenwald schools. In my new role here at the museum, I'm learning about the generous people and companies and organizations who support our program and our mission, and the Equity in the Built Environment series is no exception. I want to thank Studios Architecture and their CEO and our board member, Todd DeGarmo, and AirUp for their generous support of this program series and for believing, as we do, that our built world has been the cause of and a means to address and heal social injustices in our communities. So if you enjoyed tonight's program and want to become more involved in the impactful work that we're doing, please consider joining our membership program. If you're already a member, thank you for your support, and I really look forward to meeting you. And it is now my pleasure to welcome Marnie Keith AIA. Marnie is a principal in the Washington DC offices of Studios Architecture, an international design firm focused on workplace, mixed use, civic and institutional projects. Marnie's practice is focused on helping clients transform urban environments to build stronger communities that have an enduring impact. She currently serves as chair of the city's historic preservation review board, appointed to this important role by Mayor Bowser in 2017. Please welcome Marnie Keith. Thank you, Director, and welcome to your new position. Good evening. I'm honored to participate in today's program on the history of the Rosenwald Schools as the next conversation in the Equity in the Built Environment series. As a series sponsor, we felt it imperative that we examine how the built environment can be the cause of or the cure for social and racial injustice. We're also proud to have sponsored an exhibit currently on display at the National Building Museum on the work of Mass Design Group, a nonprofit architecture firm whose work focuses on the idea that design can and should improve people's lives and that designing for justice is the path to creating beauty. May is National Preservation Month, a time when we as a nation are called to recognize the social and economic benefits of preservation, as well as the value it brings to instilling national and community pride. Yet throughout our history, much of the history of Black people and the places that tell those stories has remained largely invisible. So it seemed the appropriate time in this series to talk about the role that preservation can play in advancing more just and equitable communities. As the chair of the Historic Preservation Review Board in DC, this is a subject that's really important to me. In this position, I've worked with preservationists and local communities to document the story of historically black communities through designation in Bloomingdale, Carver Langston, and Berry Farms. But there's so much more work to do in the district and throughout our country. Historic places that tell the full story of our country must continue to be identified, preserved, and celebrated. It's through this recognition and confrontation of our own structural racism that we acknowledge our full truth as a nation. It's through this acknowledgement and conversations like the one we're having today that we can lay a path toward equality, equity, and justice. When Brent Legs first mentioned to me the legacy of the Rosenwald schools, I was embarrassed that I had never heard of them. They're a powerful example of civil rights through the acts of private citizens to bring formal education to black students at a time when educational rights did not exist for black people. 
As I've done more research, I'm completely captivated by the educational philosophy, the thoughtful architectural design of each school, and the extensive list of Rosenwald scholars who have made a huge impact on our world. I'm pleased to have a great group of experts joining us today to share more on the details of Rosenwald and the efforts being undertaken to preserve these significant places. Andrew Filer is a photographer, author, and fifth generation Georgian. Having grown up Jewish in Savannah, he has been shaped by the rich complexities of the American South. Andrew has long been active in civic life and uses his art as an extension of his civic values. Andrew's newest book of photography, A Better Life for Their Children, Julius, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the 4,978 schools that changed America has just been published by the University of Georgia Press. This work is the first comprehensive photo documentary of the Rosenwald Schools program. His book has received early praise from the Wall Street Journal, as well as Smithsonian, Architect, and Preservation magazines. We're also joined today by Stephanie Deutsch, a native Washingtonian and resident of Capitol Hill. Stephanie is the author of You Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, and the Buildings of Schools for the Segregated South, published by Northwestern University Press. Since it was published in 2011, Stephanie has spent a lot of time visiting schools and sharing the story of Rosenwald schools. She also happens to be married to one of Rosenwald's great grandsons. Brent Leggs is the founding executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage, Cultural Heritage Action Fund, a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and largest preservation campaign in the US on behalf of historic African American places. Through the Action Fund, he leads a broad community of leaders and activists in honor of the clarion that preserving African-American cultural sites is fundamental to understanding the American story. Brent is also an adjunct associate professor and senior advisor to the Center for Preservation, the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites at the University of Pennsylvania's Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Brent will lead us in a conversation about this very engaging topic, but first we'll hear presentations from Stephanie and from Andrew and then Stephanie. Thank you. Great, thank you for that for that introduction. Let me, uh, uh, as as Marnie said, this book has gotten this book has been out for a month, and uh, it has been ex an extraordinary journey. In fact, this book is now in its third printing, uh, which is uh, quite an extraordinary uh, event and, and incredibly exciting. And yet. This book began with the other two people on this on this panel. Uh, I met Stephanie Deutsch before the first photograph of this project was ever taken. It was just an idea. And of the 85 photographs in this book, I think I was at about 20 when I sat down with Brent for the first time. And both of them have been incredible thought partners, um, generous with their time, generous with their ideas. And this uh, this book, would simply not be uh, where it is or what it is without their participation. So it's a great honor to share this, um, this virtual stage with them. So I'm just gonna start with a simple premise that the Rosenwald Schools program is one of the most transformative developments in the first half of the 20th century. It profoundly reshapes America. It profoundly changes the African-American experience and yet it largely remains hidden history and its scope and sweep is largely unknown. Uh, and so this is a great opportunity to, uh, to bring more people into this story and to, and to go into some of the intriguing uh, aspects and the importance of this story. Uh, this is a photograph of a photograph. This is a portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs in the Noble Hill School in Bartow County, Georgia. Julius Rosenwald was born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany and settled in Springfield, Illinois. He grows up across the street 
from Abraham Lincoln when Lincoln was resident in Springfield. He rises to become the, uh, the president of Sears Roebuck and Company. He turns, helps turn Sears into the world's largest retailer of its era. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his cause was what would later become known as civil rights. Booker T. Washington, this portrait of him hangs in the president's house at what is now Tuskegee University. Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, becomes one of the most prominent African-American voices of the late 19th and early 20th century, becomes an educator and is the founding principal of what was then known as Tuskegee Institute, in a historically black college in Alabama. Now the two men meet in 1911. This is a rare photograph of them printed on fabric and sewn into a quilt to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School in Richland County, South Carolina. And at the rededication ceremony, former students and former teachers were invited to sign the quilt and it hangs today in the restored schoolhouse. Now in 19, I'm gonna add one significant point. 19, they meet specifically on May 18th, 1911. Next week is the 110th anniversary of their meeting. Uh, and in 19, you have to remember 1911 is before the Great Migration, which doesn't begin until later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. And public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children. And many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African Americans. So in 1912, forming one of the earliest collaborations between Blacks and Jews, they create the program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. And they reach out to the Black communities of the South. And they say, we want you to be an active partner in your progress. So if you will contribute to a school and we will count as your contribution, cash, land, materials, or labor. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we wanna create, deliberately create a dialogue for future progress. And we want these to be public schools. So the public school system must agree to at least own, maintain and staff the school, pay for the teachers. Then Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. And from 1912, when the community in Lochapoca, Alabama raise, begins to raise money for what will become the first Rosenwald school, until 1937, when Franklin Roosevelt presides over the dedication of the last Rosenwald School in Meriwether County, Georgia, the Eleanor Roosevelt School, 1912 to 1937. This program builds 4,978 schools across 15 Southern and border states. And this program transforms America. There are two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. And that gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the movement come through these schools, Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, several members of the Little Rock Nine who integrate Little Rock Central High, and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. And Congressman Lewis, who represent, I have lived in the 5th Congressional District um, since I moved back to Atlanta 26 years ago. Con Congressman Lewis was my congressional representative for 25 years has written a glorious introduction to this book in which he describes his experiences in an Alabama Rosenwald school. Now, I, like so many other people, had never heard of Rosenwald schools and first heard of them in 2015 through a preservationist based here in Atlanta. And I, the story shocked me. I was like, how, how could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? I am, I, I am a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I have been a progressive activist my entire life. The pillars of this story, Jewish, Southern, 
progressive activists are the pillars of my life. How could I have never heard of Rosenwald School? So I came home and I Googled Rosenwald Schools. And what I found was that there were some books on the topic, but there had not been a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And I set out to do exactly that. And so uh, of the remaining 4,000, of the 4,978 schools, about 500 remain, only about half of those have been restored. In over three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states and shot 105 of the surviving schools. This is the Emory School in Hale County, Alabama, likely the oldest surviving Rosenwald School constructed around, 20, uh, around 1915. I'm gonna take you inside because I wanna show, I wanna talk a bit, particularly with this group, some of the, some of the basics of the architecture that are laid out very early in the program, and they are specifically laid out under the leadership of a man named Robert Robinson Taylor. Robert Robinson Taylor was the first African-American to attend the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the first accredited African-American architect. And he leads the architecture program at Tuskegee, many of the beautiful buildings on that campus he designed. And he leads the team of architects who lays out the basic principles of Rosenwald School. So I'm gonna add his great, great granddaughter is Valerie Jarrett, the, uh, uh, um, one of the principal aides to President Obama. So if you look in this image, you see some of the principles that, are, that were laid out at the very beginning of this program. Large windows to let in lots of light because these buildings did not originally have electricity. On the right here, cloak rooms so the dirty outer garments could be kept out, uh, could be kept separate and not would not sully the education spaces. Uh, pot belly stoves that warmed each room in the winter and vented through brick chimneys. And then you see this room divider in the back there. That room divider separating two educational spaces um, would have had a series of doors that could be closed off to create two educational spaces or folded back so that the building could be used as a community center after education hours. And these basic principles continue throughout the entire history of the program. Now, this is what's known as a one teacher school. I also found two teacher schools. This is the Noble Hill School in North Georgia, three teacher schools, the Pleasant Plains School. And notice that these are all small white clabbered structures. By the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three story red brick buildings. The Dunbar School in Pulaski County, which is Little Rock, is one of those schools. Uh, and if that looks architecture looks vaguely familiar with its Art Deco detailing, it's because the architect of the Dunbar School was also the architect of Little Rock Central High. Now, of, mo of the surviving roughly 500 Rosenwald schools, only about half of those have been restored and very few are still in use for educational purposes. This is one of the few. Dunbar is a magnet middle school, but most outgrew their educational uses long ago. And so to be, to be, they had to have been adaptively reused to be preserved. These are the Pleasant Hill quilters who sold quilts to raise money to restore the Pleasant Hill Rosenwald School, which is now a community center. And the women gather most Mondays in this community center to quilt. Some have been turned into church halls. This is the Denby School in Virginia. Others are museums, the Warfield School in Montgomery County, Tennessee. But many remain unrestored. And there is very present within this work, the plea for preservation because these are precious historic resources. They are at risk. And indeed, in the course of my travels, I came across some schools that had collapsed so recently, they were piles of rubble. The Du Bois School in Wake County, North Carolina, was demolished exactly a week before I arrived because it was deemed unsafe. But by far the most, uh, the emotional heart of this journey was the people that I met. Uh, former students like Frank and Charles Brinkley standing in the Cairo school that they attended under the original portrait of Julius Rosenwald that first hung when this school opened in 1923. Former teachers like Ellie Damer, uh, who is a civil rights activist in her own right, the widow of uh, Vernon Damer, a civil rights activist who was murdered for his activism. Vernon Damer attended this school, the Bay Springs School. Later, his wife, Ellie Damer, was a teacher in this school, and her story is told, uh, and her husband's story is told in this book. 
And people like Brent Leggs, the preservation leader that you're going to hear more from in a moment. This is, uh, this is Brent standing on the site of the Rosenwald School attended by his father. And Brent has written a, a just exquisite afterward about importance of history and memory uh, that's, part of, that's part of this book. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna close on the story of the Hopewell School in Bastrop County, Texas. This is inside the school in the midst of renovation. You'll see plastic on the floors, primer on the walls, the pot belly stove is wrapped as well. And in the center of this image is a photograph from the 19th century. This is Sophia and Martin McDonald, born into slavery uh, and upon emancipation, they, uh, Martin starts raising farm animals. He acquires some land, he acquires some more land and eventually acquires 1200 acres. And when the Rosenwald Schools program comes to Bastrop County, Texas in 1919, the family donates two acres of land for the school. They're one of their, the first teacher, teacher is their daughter. One of her students is her daughter, Sophia Williams, shown on the right here, showing, holding up the photograph of her grandparents. Her husband, Elroy, went to a diff on the left, went to a different Rosenwald School in Bastrop County. They both go off to college. They both come back, have a career as educators in Bastrop County. And now they are in the final throes of the restoration of this school. So I'm just gonna end on some comments around the title of this book, A Better Life for Their Children. Julius Rosenwald, was looking for a better life for his children. Booker T. Washington was looking for a better life for his children. The fa African-American families who were already being taxed to pay for white schools and who had to dig deep to help make these schools possible were looking for better lives for their children. And collectively, their efforts changed their communities, changed this country, and changed the world. And I think therein lies one of the central messages of this work, that individual actions actually do matter and individual actions can make a difference. Congressman Lewis writes in his foreword to this book that each of us has an obligation, a mission and a mandate, that when we see something that is not right and not just, we must find a way to get in the way. So I'll close this present part of the presentation with a refrain of Congressman Lewis's most fervent call May we all find our ways to the paths of making good trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was that was. Uh, I just I just love what you've done with your book, and I love seeing those pictures, and I love the way you've ended on such an optimistic note, um, because optimism, of course, was crucial to the Rosenwald program. It's the essence of the legacy of the Rosenwald schools. Um, but it's also the essence of the preservation movement. And one of the things that's fascinating is that the, that spirit that existed in the communities that worked together to build Rosenwald schools, that same spirit is now found in the groups working to preserve Rosenwald schools. And in many, many places, the pu people pushing to preserve the schools actually have a family connection to the school. Either they went there themselves or their parents went to the school, or their parents, part, their great grandparents gave the land. There are many, many, many connections. Um, okay, if you could put up the slide. Um, a favorite story of mine is the Scrabble School in Rappahannock County, Virginia. 25 years ago, a man named Franklin Warner retired from his job here in Washington, DC at the Office of Management and Budget and he moved back to the community where he had grown up. He was dismayed to see just down the road from his home that the schoolhouse he had attended was boarded up, it was surrounded by weeds, and it had be been designated the county dump. There were two dumpsters right in front of the school. So Mr. Warner began a campaign to change that. And with the help of grants and community fundraising, as well as input from the county, that school is now a senior center. Okay, you can change. Um, uh, as well as a small museum, visited regularly by local school children who often get to meet someone who attended that school. The board of directors managing these activities is chaired by Nan Roberts, who attended that school up to the sixth grade. And at the school's rededication as a senior center 10 years ago, 
she sang the national anthem and she'd be with us on this Zoom tonight, except that she's at a town council meeting in Culpeper. Civic education, civic engagement is a trait shared by many Rosenwald alumni. It was something that they observed in the work of their parents creating the schools and, and um, participating in uh, cleaning the schools. Uh, at Scrabble School, one day a week was soup day and one parent would bring lunch for all the children. And any, any Scrabble alumni that I talked to would always talk to me about, oh yeah, soup day, they all remember soup day. So Andrew told you about how the legacy of the Rosenwald schools, the positive impact of the schools isn't just anecdotal, it isn't just affectionate. He told you about the study by the two uh, economists from the Federal Reserve of Chicago who looked at the impact of the Rosenwald schools from a statistical point of view and found that it was very quantifiable, the positive impact that had been made by the Rosenwald schools. And that those benefits were shared by one third of the African-American children of the South during the years leading up to the end of Jim Crow segregation. But the legacy of Rosenwald's philanthropy doesn't end with the schools, significant as they were. Um, Marnique alluded to this, I think, beginning in 1928 and continuing after Rosenwald's death, the Rosenwald Fund gave fellowships to some 900 individuals of exceptional promise. You can turn the slide now. Two thirds of these fellowships went to African-Americans, many of whom went on to very significant careers in a wide variety of fields. This of course is Langton, Langston Hughes, who won uh, several fellowships, one of the preeminent writers of the Harlem Renaissance and beyond. Uh, next picture is Ralph Ellison, who uh, was sustained by his Rosenwald Fellowship while he was writing Invisible Man, still a book read in many, many high school, um, high school programs. Uh, Ralph Bunch, the diplomat who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950, John Hope Franklin, one of our preeminent uh, American historians, and Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence was a young artist in 1948 when his Rosenwald Fellowship enabled him to um, rent a studio where he could put up 60 small panels that he painted with the story of the Great Migration. And uh, many of you probably know that half of these panels are in the Phillips Collection here in Washington, D.C. For many school children, my own, my, my own kids included, their introduction to the history of the Great Migration is visiting the Phillips Collection and seeing these wonderful paintings. There's also, were 10 scholars, psychologists, and lawyers who had been recipients of Rosenwald Fellowships contributed to the legal work that went into building the case that became Brown versus Board of Education. Next slide. This is a photo of the famous experiment with dolls, documenting the negative impact of segregation on the self-esteem of African-American children. That experiment was designed by Rosenwald Fellows, Mamie Phipps Clark and Kenneth Clark. And the photo is by Gordon Parks, also a recipient of a Rosenwald Fellowship. Well, when Rosenwald died in 1932, it was front page news all over the country and he was widely hailed for his achievements in business and in philanthropy. Yet today he's barely remembered. How is it that this highly significant story has slipped from public memory? Well, one reason is Rosenwald's reluctance to place his name on things. The business he ran was called Sears Roebuck and he never sought to change that. He gave the founding donation to create the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago but when the Board of Trustees wanted to call it the Rosenwald Industrial Museum, he said no, he didn't, he didn't want his name on it. Um, and the schools, which we now refer to using the shorthand term Rosenwald schools, were only rarely named for him. They were named for donors, for places. Some had funny names like the Bear Swamp and Beaver Dam. There were biblical references like Bethlehem. Gethsemane, Shiloh. There were six schools named Calvary. And there were 58 Rosenwald schools that I've been able to find called Hope. Uh, it's desks from the Hope School 
in South Carolina that are in the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture here. Next slide. 13 schools. Oh, this is actually one of the few schools that was named Julius Rosenwald. This is a school in the northern neck of Virginia in Reedville that was called the Westmoreland County Training School. And in 1932, when Rosenwald died, they changed the name to the Julius Rosenwald School. Next slide. Um, there were 13 schools called Friendship. And uh, this one is in Johnson County, Texas. And it's one of my very favorite pictures of a Rosenwald School. You can see it's very small. It's way out there in, in the country, but that, that's the Friendship School. So the schools, there were people who went to Rosenwald schools who had never heard the name Rosenwald. They didn't know they went to a Rosenwald school. Uh, so it's one of the reasons that, that they have, that the story has, um, has been forgotten. There is now a campaign gaining steam to preserve the rich legacy of Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools with the creation of a national historical site uh, which will have a visitor center in Chicago and satellite locations in several schools. You can give that last slide. Legislation mandating a feasibility study of such a park was signed into law early this year and will be considered by the National Park Service in the fall. If you Google Rosenwald Park campaign, you'll find information about it. Um, obviously this important, remarkable story deserves to be more widely known and appreciated. Thank you for that, Stephanie and Andrew. You can join us and we'll start our conversation. I just wanna say, listening to you both speak, the way you move through this history is, is almost like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I was so inspired by your remarks and your, your cadence. And it's shocking that more Americans don't know the power of this story the power of these communities, the power of multiracial cooperation, the, the power of social innovation and architecture. There's just so much that we can dig into. But I wanna start with the personal because when I think of historic preservation and the power of place, for me, it's both personal and it's professional. And since you all know me well, Stephanie, as we were talking earlier, you met me when I was interning for the National Trust. And Andrew, we had met recently and, and Marnique and I met through some friends a couple of years ago when I moved to DC. But my foundational story starts with Rosenwald schools. And when I was in the graduate preservation program at the University of Kentucky and was assigned to conduct the statewide inventory of Rosenwald schools, during that year and a half long research project, I would learn that my mom and dad attended Rosenwald schools. And I remember being at a building that was literally being held up by a tree. It was in pretty bad condition. And I was, I toured and I could see like the sunlight coming through this broken window pane. It smelled like decay. And I had this multi-sensory experience with that history, but I started to understand the transcendent nature of this work. And for me, preservation had the potential to remove the, the gap between space and time. That Booker T. Washington's vision for uplifting the black community, his ideals, that bold kind of vision that he had for uplifting black America through a partnership with Julius Rosenwald that that work was still ongoing and real and had directly impacted my life through my parents attending Rosenwald schools. So my personal life has forever been changed because of this history. And it has inspired me to ask myself this daily question. What is my social responsibility to continue the work of uplifting diverse communities? So what's your personal story? Well, I, I can say that um, the, the Rosenwald story also had a profound impact on me. As Marnique said, I had a personal connection to it, which was that my husband um, 
is a great grandson of Julius Rosenwald, although this story was not one that he was aware of and it was not talked about in his family. So I came, I came to the story with a family connection, but I was absolutely um, astounded when I got into it and learned the connection with Booker T. Washington and the work because I realized that I, as a fairly well-educated American, was ignorant about an awful lot. I really hadn't appreciated the depth of the challenges that, uh, that, that faced African-Americans. I just, I, I, I wasn't really very aware of it. And I'll tell you something, um, Brett, that, that um, happened in Kentucky. You've probably been to the Sadieville School. Have yeah, you been there? I have. I visited, I visited the Sadieville School on a day that happened to be uh, snowy and very cold. And Sadieville was built in 1917. It's a one-room schoolhouse in a tiny town. Um, and I went into the schoolhouse and it, it hasn't been all gussied up. It looks sort of as if it had been in use yesterday. And I went into that schoolhouse and I, I almost started crying. I just had this overwhelming feeling of, of um, what it was like to be a child going to that school. And so many people, so many of the people who had been to those schools talked about how warm the atmosphere was. It was so, the teachers were so caring. The, the community had come together. They knew the, the other kids in the school were often their siblings, their cousins, neighbors. And the contrast of how cold it was actually in the school and the, the way people had talked so fondly and affectionately about the atmosphere of the schools really struck me. That's beautiful. That's beautiful, yeah. So I, you know, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. And if my parents didn't like something, they would pick up the phone and they would try to change it. And it's what I call small town empowerment. You may look but you fight the battle. And so I grew up with this sense of we should, we should try to make things better. And one of my early memories from that, my mom was an art teacher and was outside of her teaching in the public school system. She taught art at a local science museum and they, um, and she enrolled these students in her class. And it turns out she had enrolled an integrated class. Museum leadership told her that she could not teach an integrated class. And she said, it's my class. I can teach who I want to teach. And they fired her. <laughs> um, and so, you know, go forward. The, to, um, I, I, I moved back to Atlanta, Georgia, because it was one of those places that no matter where you were from, you could get involved. It had grown so rapidly it had outstripped the traditional sense of power structure. And the reason I had been happy in Atlanta is that I had been, I had been involved in the not-for-profit community here. I have been involved in the political world here. And a lot of that work has been building on that legacy of black Jewish coalition. Mm -hmm. as, as Brent, as you well know, I'm close to Stacey Abrams and I have been friends for 21 years. I was on the policy team for her campaign back in 2018. Um, I was actually involved in all of her campaigns for city council, for, uh, excuse me, for state house. She was actually, I lived in her district. Um, I was involved in Shirley Franklin's races. We have a municipal race coming up. I'll be involved in that. And, you know, there is a direct relationship between Julius Rosen and Booker T. Washington, Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, marching mm -hmm. with Dr. King and famously saying, that when I marched with Dr. King, it felt like my feet were praying to what just happened here in the state months ago. In a, in a two month long uh, runoff, John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock crisscrossed this state together eight weeks. And their, their victory, in which Georgia sent its first Jew and its first African American to the United States Senate their victory stands on the shoulders of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. Love that. You know, I grew up in Virginia. And so when I saw the map of where these schools are located, I knew for certain that somebody in my family 
had to have gone to a Rosenwald school, knowing that they're in Mecklenburg County and, uh, and near St. Paul uh, in Virginia, St. Paul's College. Uh, and the more I talked to people about Rosenwald schools, the more people said, oh yeah, so-and-so in my family attended a Rosenwald school. Um, you know, my friend Ernie Jarvis uh, let me know that his grandfather, Charles Drew, um, oh, yeah. uh, is a Rosenwald scholar. Um, and these, so, you know, the fact that I had never heard of them, but they were so close to me, uh, again, was, um, was mind boggling. But um, I was struck as an architect by the thoughtful creation of these schools. Um, you know, everything about each school was very intentional. And I think, although they all look different, there is a, an architectural character to each of the schools that makes them distinctly Rosenwald. Um, there was thought to sustainability and natural light and the placement of windows, the size of windows, the location of the stove. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it, was, um, it was great to that so much thought and care and attention went into creating these schools to um, uh, help further education uh, in the betterment of Black students, particularly at a time when this wasn't happening broadly across, across the country. And, um, and as I read more and learned that the schools were intentionally designed to be very simple and understated so as not to attract attention to themselves uh, for fear of being uh, ostracized or burned. It was just a harsh reminder of the, the times in which these schools were uh, existing. And, um, and the, the, um, the real imperative that these schools needed to exist. Um, and, and, and so I, I've, as I've learned more and more, I've just been completely moved and, and emotional about the stories. I'm so glad, Andrew, that I received your, your book yesterday and was able to start digging into it. Um, it's, it's incredible. I got my book yesterday too. Right. <laughs> and called Andrew on the phone and had a, had, a, had a moment. It was such a beautiful book. But I wanna build on what you just said, Marnique. For me, the intersection between racial justice and architecture comes alive when you start to understand the importance of architecture and design. And when I traveled around the state to identify the extant schools, I started to realize that, and Andrew showed this in, in one of his photographs, kind of the three pillars of the black community. You've got the church, You've got the school building, and then you've got the cemetery. It creates this unique cultural landscape, and the variation of, of the built environment and the architecture. If we fast forward today, are we still confronting the same inequities in architecture and in the historic built environment? Um. I think, I, unfortunately, I think so. Um, you know, and I think we've made progress. Um, you know, the, as Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. Mm -hmm. um, change happens slowly and we have seen change. Certainly um, there are, we have equal rights um, as a society, but we saw, particularly over the past year through the pandemic, that there's still a lot of inequity um, and injustice that happens. And, and I do think that architects have a huge role to play in helping to create equitable communities. But I think it has to start with us all recognizing the, um, the truth and the history of why uh, this inequity or inequity and injustice exists and doing all we can to help uplift those who have suffered as a result. Um, and so, you know, building communities with great schools, 
uh, like Rosenwald, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but with great schools, um, making sure that we are providing for places for healthy food um, and access to, um, to healthy spaces, um, making sure that um, you know, people have access to um, economic opportunities and opportunities for growth. I think all of those things are important and all things that uh, the built environment can um, help us towards, but we are unfortunately not there yet. Um, but, um, but I'm hopeful given the conversations that have um, been happening, happening, particularly over the past year, that we are moving in the right direction. I think that was beautifully said and, and it aligns closely with the program that I lead which is the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, created in 2017 in the aftermath of Charlottesville. And we remember the tragedy that happened. And it was a moment where culture, heritage, and public spaces collided in the most negative way. It was clear that we were confronting the miseducation of Americans. And it also was clear that historic preservation was part of a national discourse, which is, not rare, you know, our our nation doesn't talk about historic preservation. And so we wanted to demonstrate that preservation of historic built environment could be leveraged for positive social impact in people's lives. And so the goal was to support the preservation of 150 black history sites to expand the American story. And so what you just described, making preservation and design work people-centered and leveraging the power of place to have that impact on people's lives in this moment creates power. And we, um, we need more folks like you that wear the architecture hat, the preservation hat. Andrew, I'm curious about the connection between your creative spirit, culture and place. All of that is expressed in this beautiful publication. What moves you about this connection in your work? You know, I think Stephanie actually touched on this earlier. And that is, I think the center of this story is optimism. I mean, Congressman Lewis and all the things that he said I still remember the first time I heard him say, be hopeful, be optimistic. Mm. And it was so jarring because of everything that he had been through. And he would say, and he would follow that line by reminding everybody, our work is not the work of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the work of a lifetime. And, you know, if you think about that, the, um, you know, Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, at some level, are what we would call a pra- pragmatist. So what are, what are pragmatists? Pragmatists basically have two things in common. They're optimists and they're thinking very long-term. They both knew that solving the education crisis among African-Americans was not going to be solved in a generation. And yet that's what they did. Mm-hmm. And it's this combination, play long ball, to be optimistic, that I think was the heart of their work. It was the heart of John Lewis's work. And at some level, it's the heart of the work of all four of us. You know, historic preservation is about, and, and I'm gonna go back, actually, go back to something actually that you said, Brent. This idea that um, we have, many people have taught inaccurate history, incomplete history. And at some level, what we're all doing mm-hmm. is more inclusive American narrative. And that is ultimately long ball and it is ultimately optimistic. That's it. So do you all consider yourself a preservationist? So I consider myself an accidental preservationist. It was a random 15 minute conversation. And two months later I was in grad school studying historic preservation that, you know, shifted the trajectory of my career. And at that time, when I was searching for my professional identity, I was motivated by making money. And when the Dean of the 
graduate preservation program said I can make a shitload of money using tax credits. I signed up to go to, <laughs> to, to grad school. So I am very much the accidental preservationist. What about you all? I would say accidental sounds actually about right because I, I approached the story really as a historian. You know, I, I was interested in writing a biography. And then when I, when I discovered the, the synergy between Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, I wanted to kind of write a, a double biography. And then, oh, there's this preservation part of it. So I would say I was an I, I was a accidental preservationist too. I mean, I'd always loved visiting historic sites, but grand ones, you know, I thought about castles and cathedrals and um, you don't think of simple wooden structures. I hadn't thought about that as something to preserve, but of course it does because it so powerfully, like what I said about Sadieville, it so powerfully tells the story and you experience something completely unique when, when you go there. Um, yes, accidental preservationist, Brett, that's probably all of us. <laughs> I think I, it, for me, it's I, it, it, preservation was, I think more in my DNA. I mean, I grew up in Savannah, right? The historic restoration movement, it's one of the places that the movement begins. Lee Adler, who helped find found the National Trust, who created the mechanism of the revolving fund that's been such an essential tool in historic preservation. I mean, he, he and his wife were friendly with my parents. Um, my father's office was in the historic district. My parents, real estate developers, and helped do some of the restoration of buildings in downtown. This idea of the urban fabric of Savannah which is became the, you know, now is expressed in what are, what's called new urbanism um, of squares and walkability. And I grew up with that. And, and I took urban planning classes in, in college. Uh, and, and then I had this dream that I would one day live in a restored fire station, two-story fire station that would have a pole. And I moved back to Atlanta, Georgia and all the fire stations are one story. Um, but my wife and I end up stumbling into this building that has this incredibly interesting history uh, to it associated with the overturning of the convict leasing system in the early 20th century. Uh, and we end up going through the process and putting our building on the National Register of Historic Places, which comes full circle. In the course, there's a hundred rows, I counted them. There's a, there were a hundred, when I did this book, when I first, when I turned in my manuscript, there were a hundred Rosenwald schools listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. And I read 50 of those nomination forms because I knew how much information was in them because I had to write one of them. And uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm a little bit more, I, I kind of grew up with this stuff. I think I am more of a reluctant preservationist because I didn't ever think that I should have that title as an architect. You know, we are we are trained to want to build things and, and build from scratch. But what I've found throughout my career is that the projects that I enjoy most, projects that I am most passionate about um, are those that involve preserving uh, architecture and transforming it into something that still talks about the history of the place, but um, allows that structure, that history to be adapted for some modern use. So, you know, one of the, one of my first major projects as an architect was working on um, the AIA headquarters project here in Washington, DC, and thinking about how to reposition a modernist building um, to achieve net zero energy. So, I mean, that, that sparked so many of my current interests with historic preservation and sustainability. And, um, and I believe is really what led me to um, finally uh, come to terms with the fact that I am probably more of a preservationist than I would admit. Um, so I, I, I see preservation as uh, the opportunity to recall history, uh, but in a way that 
allows us to think about modern uses, mm -hmm. um, perhaps historic facilities for modern uses. So um, I think I oh. am. We're glad you came out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Joined us all. <laughs> Let's, there are a couple of questions about the designers and architects of the school. What, what do you know about who were the actual kind of brainchild behind the design of these schools, both the, the physical building itself and then also the landscape? Well, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, as as a Andrew said the very first schools were designed by Robert W. Robert uh, Taylor from um, from Tuskegee, and uh, he put together those designs, those very simple designs, um, and and those were the first schools. Uh, later, when the program became more institutionalized, the the Rosenwald Fund kind of took over control of the program, and they they had standardized plans. Um, some of them had been designed by Clinton Calloway, who worked at Tuskegee, mm -hmm. and um, and they. One reason so many Rosenwald schools look the same is that they sent out uh, standardized plans. And if you were part of the Rosenwald Building Program, you had access to those plans. You didn't have to pay for them. And um, one of the one of the very interesting things about that is that there are instances of white schools being built to those plans because they were such they were such very effective um, efficient plans uh, I was visiting a school down in Goochland County Virginia and on my way there I passed a school that looked just like the school I was heading towards and I when I got to where I was going I said what about that school down the road and they said oh that was the white school mm -hmm. um, and the the plans were so effective that they were sometimes uh, used more broadly the um, Andrew, what year was it that the book came out? The the the, the book of standardized plans. I can't remember what year it came out. But in any case, it mandated that the schools had to have two acres of land. They wanted mm -hmm. two acres of land. There are even plans for the um, the outhouses. They had to be built to certain uh, specifications and and um, sanitary sanitary. Uh, out, out buildings, they called them. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of care and attention given to them. And as Andrew said, those folding doors that that made the spaces useful, made the made the spaces um, so adaptable to different uses. That was one of the great great innovations. Well, what I'll, here's what I'll add to that: um, the schools were basically modest, and they were modest for two reasons. One was to um, save cost, and two was to not provoke the ire, backlash, otherwise known as arson of the white citizenry. And yet, remember, the, the Rosenwald Fund is putting out these, these plans, but the African-American community is playing an active role. And there are wonderful instances throughout the program of the African-American community expressing agency by changing the plans. One of the, the Fletcher Dressler, who was an uh, architecture professor uh, at uh, Peabody College in Nashville, reviewed these plans uh, and updated the plans with Samuel Smith in 1920. And one of his rules was no cupolas because he saw cupolas as reflective of church architecture and therefore, to him, it violated the separation of church and state. Mm. And yet, I, in 105 schools, I came across three that had Cuban. That is the African-American community expressing agency. Uh, and the last thing, I'll just the last example I'll give you of that is the Lincoln School in Pikeville, Tennessee. All of the walls and ceilings are covered in this beautiful pressed, decorative pressed tin. That is, the, and the beauty of that, the uniqueness of that, that was agency. And so the African-American community, they're, they're, they were making clear their role as active participants in this program. I did see someone um, wrote in the chat that they thought that an, a school had been designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm 
under the Ros Rosenwald program, uh, but never built. Is that correct? I think yeah. Wright, uh, Wright uh, conceptualized a Rosenwald school, but I, he was never part of the program. I don't think it was ever really considered. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was never built. It was, the Frank Lloyd Wright design was never part of the uh, Rosenwald School program, but he was, he was, um, I think he was interested, it was an interesting challenge for him. Mm -hmm. sure. and, and many of the principles of Rosenwald schools were principles that he, you know, functionality and, and uh, these were things he was interested in. I'll go back to, to the point that we were talking about earlier. Yes, Frank Lloyd Wright designed uh, a Rosenwald School, did a Rosenwald School plan. It exists. You can see it. And remember that point about simplicity? <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright didn't quite get that. No, he did not. <laughs> That's why it wasn't built. It was, to say it was grandiose by Rosenwald standards would be an understatement. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> When I was doing my research, I learned that George Washington Carver was the de facto landscape designer. I mean, who knew? You know, he was known to be the, the peanut butter kind of guy and, and had no idea that he contributed to the design of the landscape. And, and what I also thought was interesting, every school was encouraged to have a hog on site in order to sustain, you know, the, the, the schools and provide the food if necessary. I mean, it was such a detailed kind of guide to the establishment of, of schools. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, again, getting back to what Andrew said, the, the interplay between standardization and sort of individual um, agency. One of the other tensions, of course, was um, you know, were they, were these schools, uh, Booker T. Washington, more vocational type schools or were they standard high schools and, or standard schools? And so many of the schools had what they called a shop room. Mm -hmm. But in some of the schools, the so-called shop room was actually the kitchen where they uh, prepared lunch or the shop room was really another classroom, but it was called the shop. And it was, you know, it was, it was like lip service to the idea that, that we're doing vocational training. Now they also did at many of the schools have gardens where they produced you know, vegetable gardens and canning was one of the things that in some of the schools, the girls were taught, you know, remember home ec? Well, it was a precursor of that. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of sort of give and take. So building on this idea of, of self-agency and determination, when I look at HBCUs, in particular Tuskegee, that has a prominent role in this story, you know, that university stands as the physical manifestation of a, of a social movement in response to a crisis in Black education. To then think about the social innovation that would be birthed at Tuskegee that would establish the initial school building plans and partnerships. And, and Andrew, given your previous book on the architecture of HBCUs, share with me, what, what is the contribution of HBCUs? And in many ways, their contribution has been undervalued and overlooked just like Rosenwald schools. What do you think about HBCUs and, and Tuskegee? So let me give you, I'll give you two answers to that question. First of all, um, HBCUs fit a very, very important American narrative. The first taxpayer funded school in America is created before there is the United States of America. It's founded in Dedham, Massachusetts in 1644. That's 366 years ago. There's a direct connection between that school, land grant colleges, 1862, which fund colleges where pe people on this, on this, uh, in this discussion attended land grant colleges, to the creation of HBCUs, predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly in the decades after the Civil War, Rosenwald schools, the educational provisions of the GI Bill, which transform America from relatively poor to relatively prosperous, to Brown v. Board of Education, and what are we talking about today? 
crushing up the student debt, college affordability, this 376 year narrative arc is a tradition at risk. Um, that, that education has been the on-ramp of the, to the American middle class. Uh, and and that's, that is something worth focusing on because it's important. And HBCUs are a hugely important part of that narrative. There were originally about 120 HBCUs. There are now about 100. Those 100 HBCUs are 3% of colleges in America. They represent more than 10% of African-Americans who go to college and more than 25% of African-Americans who earn degrees. And so they remain an essential on to the American class. And as long as people are voting with their feet and choosing to attend these schools, we have to honor and support that on-ramp uh, to the American middle class. I'd just, I'd just like to add to that, that um, Julius Rosenwald was uh, a major supporter of many HBCUs, not just Tuskegee, of which he was a board member for many years, and Howard, where he gave a lot of money, but a lot of the smaller ones, um, uh, Bennett College in, um, in North Carolina, Dillard in um, New Orleans, Livingstone College in North Carolina, um, many, many historically black colleges also benefited from Rosenwald's generosity. It's so beautiful. And we've created a, a program that we launched in February. It's the HBCU Cultural Heritage Stewardship Initiative, where we have partnered with eight HBCUs with funding individual building preservation plans and two campus-wide preservation plans. It's a partnership with the National Endowment for Humanities. And it's a way for us just like our work with Rosenwald schools, whether it's the National Park Campaign, establishing a, a small but hopefully mighty $1 million endowment, where we'll start providing micro grants to the grassroots uh, communities behind these Rosenwald school projects, the importance of preserving this history and to equip those that steward, whether it's institutional buildings across this vast collection of HBCU cultural assets, or it's the vanishing collection of Rosenwald schools across the South. But collectively, we have to invest as a nation in the preservation of this, of this cultural memory and these assets. And as Marnique and you all continue to say, to understand that they can be adaptively reuse for modern purposes to support modern needs. What do you think is the opportunity as it relates to preserving these histories as a way to honor the full contributions of Black America, of Jewish Americans and others in helping to create a more equitable society? You mean with respect to the preservation of the remaining Rosenwald schools? Yeah, the preservation of HBCU campuses, the preservation of Rosenwald schools, the preservation of Brown versus Board of Education sites, to be able to preserve the diverse American educational story. Yeah, it's it's incredibly important, um, and uh, you know this is this is a part of the um, the story that is so close to. Um, I mean, all of the majority, if not all of black community, because it is how we have um, grown and thrived uh, as a community over the history of this country. Um, you know, education, as you know, a few of us have said tonight is, is the pathway to uh, better opportunities. It's the pathway to hope. It always has been. And so these sites um, have played a pivotal role in helping to bring us closer um, as a people toward uh, equity and justice. And so um, I think it's incredibly important that those stories of how that has happened, um, which also reflects on how far we've come and um, and the challenges that we've had to face, uh, it's all incredibly important as a, a story of the history of this country. 
And I'd just add to that, Marnique, that um, unlike when you visit the sort of grand type sites I was talking about earlier, Rosenwald schools and HBCUs preserve and celebrate uh, ordinary people, people who just, you know, they're, 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 they're nobody special. They're just people who want their children to go to school. They're, 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 um, they're, not, they're not famous necessarily for what they accomplished. They're, they're, they're just participating. They're just wanting to be part of what we're doing. They're wanting to, to do the normal things, go to school, be educated, become a contributing person uh, in society, work together with other people. And that's the story that's celebrated in these sites. The HBCUs, even more so in some ways. I mean, the, the, the story of the HBCUs is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Brent, I'm gonna go back to something you said earlier about Charlottesville. If you look at the language that was used by the white supremacists that gathered in Charlottesville, it was rooted in lost cause mythology. It was rooted in a false telling of American history, mm -hmm. yet it created that moment. And it has, it, that language has been pervasive in a lot of the white supremacist violence uh, that we have, the increasing white supremacist violence that we've seen. That shows the power of history to motivate. In that case, it comes from a place of miseducation. We need no stronger evidence of the importance of, edu of accurate education. And telling an accurate American story means telling a inclusive and diverse American story. And so the path forward uh, for America, a diverse and inclusive America, is an accurate and diverse, inclusive version of our history. It's so true. And as I look at John, Congressman John Lewis over your shoulder and think about the humble beginnings that's connected to the a Rosenwald School and how ordinary citizens can accomplish extraordinary achievements because of the, the cooperation between Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, the Black community and others that supported what had to be revolutionary in education, especially Black education. So now that we have about 15 minutes left, I wanna open it up to the audience to ask questions. And I'm going to start filtering questions. And one was related to the Rosenwald School Fellowship. This comes from Fran McCracken. Can you tell a little bit more about the Rosenwald Fellowships? How were they funded? Were they for college or projects such as supporting artists? Does the fund still exist? Well, I'll start with that. No, the Rosenwald Fund does not still exist because one of uh, Julius Rosenwald's beliefs was he did, not, he did not believe in perpetual endowments. So he designed his Rose, the Rosenwald Fund to uh, only last 25 years after his death. And so in 1948, the Rosenwald Fund put itself out of existence. You know, the, the Ford Foundation will go on forever. The Carnegie Foundation, those are perpetual endowments. But Rosenwald felt that each generation will create wealth and each generation, the wealth will be used for the needs of that generation. So that was a very strong belief of his. Um, the Rosenwald uh, Fellowships were created, I think I said this in 1928, and the idea was to identify individuals of promise and give them, give them funding at a significant, you know, to, to, to help them get started. Some of them were already established uh, figures when they got uh, their fellowships. The, uh, the idea for the fellowships came from James Weldon Johnson, um, the author of Lift Every Voice and Sing, who by that time was uh, working for the NAACP and he had a lot of interaction with the Rosenwald Fund and he and Charles Johnson, who was a um, sociologist and later president of Fisk, it was their idea that 
that individuals could be identified. And um, there was also a sense at that time in 1928 that maybe the arts was an area where prejudice wasn't quite as strong mm -hmm. and where white America was maybe a little more willing to uh, admit African-Americans kind of accept them. And so, especially in the early years, many of the people who got the grants were artists. I think I told you, Marian Anderson went to Europe for the first time with her Rosenwald Fund. Um, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston got one, uh, writers and artists. But they also had a major significance in helping a whole generation of people whose names we might not know, but who went on to become very significant um, academics. Um, the woman who ran for 30 years the library at Howard University, Dorothy Wesley Porter, she was a Rosenwald Fellow. Um, not a well known, not, not a name well known, but incredibly significant uh, contribution. Um, so they, they were funded by the Rosenwald Fellowship. They weren't enormous. They were $3,000 to $5,000, which is uh, like $30,000 in today's, you know, they, they, were, they were nice, but they weren't uh, enormous. Um, but they were, I would say they were highly significant in establishing a generation of, of professionals. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Andrew, I could kind of go on and on because there's so many interesting people who became, who were Rosenwald fellows. No, um, that's a good summary. Uh, I, I'll tell you this one little story. We all know the name Alex Haley who wrote Roots. Well, Alex Haley's father was a Rosenwald fellow. He got a fellowship to study agricultural science, which was his field. And um, his children, uh, he had three boys. Alex was one. George was one who was a well-known um, uh, professor. And the third child was named Julius Embry, Julius Embry Rosenwald. Julius Embry Cornell Haley. The Julius was for Julius Rosenwald. Edwin Embry was the, pres the president of the Rosenwald Fund. Edwin Embry was the, and uh, Cornell was where he got his graduate degree that was funded by the Rosenwald Fund. And uh, I just found that um, quite touching and fascinating. What about the YMCA buildings? We just got a question from, from, Someone in the audience, if you all can share a little bit more about the connection to YMCA buildings. I can. That is another just amazing story. Um, so Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington were actually both very interested in and involved with the YMCA movement, which um, you all remember um, for a lot of what the YMCAs did was they provided YMCA centers where people could live. You know, if you were moving to a new town, you could stay there. Um, and so in about 1910, Rosenwald was asked to contribute to a YMCA in uh, Chicago, where he lived. And uh, he said, well, I'll, I mean, as a Jew, you know, the Young Men's Christian Association, he said, I'll leave that to my Christian brothers to create the YMCA in Chicago. But when you create a YMCA for black people, come talk to me. So the YMCA lost no time in uh, sending a representative to talk to him. This was in 1910. And uh, it was a man named Jesse Moreland. He was utterly astonished when Rosenwald said, okay, I'll give $75,000 to any city in America that can raise $100,000, I think, I may be getting this, the number wrong, but that, that can raise a larger grant of money from its African-American community or from both communities to build an African-American YMCA. And it was his first big, uh, big program and ultimately led to the building of 27 YMCAs, including one here in Washington, DC, the 12th Street Y. The one here in Atlanta, uh, the Butler Street Y. The Butler Street Y in Atlanta that, that yeah, um, and uh, huge. 
absolutely huge um, incentive, incentivizing um, participation. And just to put that into his, briefly into historical context, remember, this is 1910. This is December of 1910. Julius oh. Rosenberg and Booker T. Washington do not meet until May of 1911. And so this is the, this Rosenwald's interest in African-American uplift, that's his word. Mm -hmm. Julius Rosenwald's interest in what becomes later known as challenge grants all actually are are presaged in this uh, YMCA initiative. Mm. Yeah. Just so much initiative. Glenda Jenkins asked the question, this gets back to the, the simple structures part of the conversation. How can we advance the ability of simple structures as Ms. Deutsch refers to them that are often very strongly representative of specifically Gullah Geechee and broadly African American culture and history. Marnique, I'm going to pass this one to you. I'm not sure if I know how to um, answer that. I mean, certainly um, the, I know less about the Gullah Geechee, but certainly the simple structures of the South shotgun houses and um, camelbacks that are prevalent in New Orleans and, and those parts of the South. Um, but, uh, but I, th I, you know, there were, um, I think all of them have a, a rigor of thought put into why they are designed the way they, they were. Um, you know, specifically and, and often for climate, um, uh, particularly in that region. But, uh, you know, the, from my understanding, the thinking around the Rosenwald schools was um, not linked to, uh, to th that archetype, um, but more to the, the standards that we've talked about today um, and the specifications. I'm not sure if that gets at the root of her question or if uh, anyone else has thoughts on that. Well, I'm, I'm thinking back because you all know I travel the country and I have the good fortune to be able to see so many African-American historic places. And many of them are simple, unadorned structures that at first glance don't seem to hold a lot of meaning and significance. And Stephanie, earlier when you said that that your understanding as a, as a kid was the grand mansion, something that is made of brick and a different material that's meant to last and represents a sense of permanence or even represents a sense of value. And I think we are, are as a, a community, as a nation, as preservationists are beginning to, to reimagine architectural significance. And, and value something that is simple, that is made of materials that isn't meant to be permanent, yet the history that is embodied within those cultural walls lives on in, in, in permanence. This is making me think of, um, I just went uh, two weeks ago to the show at the museum um, uh, beauty is justice, or is it justice is beauty? Um, mm -hmm. But the principles that the mass design group talks about in the structures that they built, especially the facilities in Africa, the, the hospitals and the, mm -hmm. the idea of using local materials, um, uh, incorporating uh, local artisans, to make things and having having the building actually sort of express something about the community it is created to serve. It's very powerfully evoked in that show. Um, and it made me think a lot about, about Rosenwald schools, about that, that, that really profound connection between a building and the community and the place, the place where it is and the community that it's built to serve. They're, they're all, they should be kind of all one. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Andrew, as we come to the end of our time together, 
I, I want to give you a last thought. And as you think about that, I want to give a shout out to Aviva Kempner, who has joined us tonight. And if you haven't seen her documentary film on the Julius Rosenwald story, check it out. It really is fascinating. And it can be an introduction as you begin your process of reading these two amazing books. Andrew. Well, I think what I'll say is, first of all, thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. It's been an honor to share the stage with all of you. And Stephanie and Brent in particular, thank you for leading me on, on this incredible journey. Um, I started this, I knew this was an amazing story from the beginning. I wasn't sure how to tell it visually. And as I, it was when, as I got into it that I found all of these incredible connections. Rosenwald School's directly connection to the Tuskegee syphilis study that embody the story of the Great Migration that are connected to the Trail of Tears. And it's what moved me to write a short story that went with each of these photographs. So um, if you've enjoyed this conversation tonight, I would, um, I would hope that you would spend some time with these images, and, but also spend time with the stories because I think that you will find that you'll come away, that you'll be moved, that you'll be inspired. And in the spirit of this conversation tonight, I think you'll come away a little bit more optimistic about the possibility and the prospect for positive change in America. Be optimistic, play long ball. Mm. <laughs> Beautifully said. I now want to turn it over to Eileen. I have to go off script and just say that I'm I'm just astounded by what I learned tonight and humbled by how much I didn't know and inspired by the way you all framed this story. And Andrew, I will be purchasing your book and um, just thank you so much, Marnique, Brent, Stephanie, Andrew, for such powerful programming and making such compelling connections to the built environment and our social history. Um, for our audience, and I saw some questions in the chat already that uh, this program is being recorded and, and an edited version will be available within about seven business days. And I just wanna say, consider checking out our upcoming programming. Next Wednesday, May 19th, we kick off a really um, exciting series on climate action leading up to our June 17th honor awards. And um, it's a very incredibly important and timely exploring the building industry's role in addressing the climate crisis, um, featuring our honoree, the renowned firms Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, and an impressive roster of expert panelists. Thank you again for joining us tonight.